Good evening. It's Dr. Renee, and I am your host of the Ask Dr. Renee Show. Thank you for joining us. If you're not familiar with our show, our show is here to motivate and inspire you to live the life that you deserve. So if you have not watched the show before, some of our past guests have been Elvira Guzman of LVGPR, uh, Cupid of q Robics and line par Dance Line Party King, um, Valicia Butterfield of Ween, and Paul Carrick Brunson of the Paul Carrick Brunson Agency. You can watch all the past shows on my YouTube channel, Ask Dr. Renee, as well as on my website, AskDrRenee.info. Our guest tonight is Rodney Perry. Welcome to the show, Rodney. Hey. <laughs> I love the bow tie and the glasses. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So I'm, let's get started. I'm talking to you, Doc, so I wanted to look studious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's get started. So, Rodney, you were born in Louisiana, but you from no. Chicago. No, 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 no. Oh. It's the reverse. I was born in Chicago. And, and then moved. Uh, and we moved to Louisiana like my sophomore year of high school. Gotcha. Well, my sophomore year of high school, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Now, do you have any siblings? I do. I'm the oldest of five. Okay. okay. Well, some I, more. I got some more siblings, actually. Uh, you know, my. You know, I didn't grow up with my father, so he has children. But you know, I usually count the ones I grew up with. Right. But, you know, some of them about to get off the list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can understand. So Rodney is very into Periscope, like I am, and we probably were some of the very first uh, people of color <laughs> that got on Periscope. All right. So. He has shown his mother several times, so I've seen his mom, and um, she she now lives down there by him in Atlanta. So, um, so now take us through you. Um, so you graduated from high school down in down south. Yes. And then you, um, I know you decided to go into the service after your first child was born. Um. Well, she was on the way. Uh huh. Well, well, shortly after, not not long after she was born. Uh, you know, I was at a in a position where I was still living at home with my mom. And, you know, I just didn't want to have my mom taking care of me and mine. And so, you know, I, I made a decision. I was walking to work. I was working at a place called Shoe Town. And I was walking to work, hot Louisiana sun, and a recruiter uh, offered to give me a ride. And I had already considered the military, you know, out of high school. Um, so, I mean, I was familiar with, you know, the Army and, um, and the Marine Corps but I really hadn't considered the Navy. And this guy pitched me in that short ride to my uh, to my job. And honestly, I was in boot camp about seven days later. Oh, that was fast. Yeah. So which um, which department of the air of the service did you do? I'm old Navy boy now. OK, Navy. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. So how many you were there? Eight years, right? Eight years in the Navy from 1990 to 90. This is how stupid I was. I joined during the war. I mean. That is crazy. <laughs> it, just, it just never occurred to me that we were at war. And uh, so now that I look back on it, I probably wouldn't have done it again. But uh, I've met some lifelong friends. And, you know, I was able to take care of my daughter. Her teeth are straight right now because of that. <laughs> okay, I got you. So, did your your mother was okay with that? You know what? I, it really I don't know if I even gave her a choice. I mean, I was I was nineteen or twenty at the time, so you know it really wasn't her her call. Right. I mean, I I, I got I I I was ready to rock and roll and start living life, man. Uh -huh. So you got out of the Navy and you moved to LA then. Yeah, I I, I got out in nineteen ninety eight packed up my family, left the security of the military. And when I tell you, uh, one, my mom, who was one of my, my best friends, uh, she she read me the riot act. Don't, I don't know how you're going to take care of them damn kids. you trying to be funny. You ain't that funny, first of all. Let's start that, you know. And, <laughs> and she told me probably a couple of weeks after we had that conversation, that she had to put that type of pressure on me because if I couldn't take her pressure, then I wasn't ready to deal with the pressure that I was going to deal with, you know, embarking on this new adventure. So uh, I packed up the family, moved to L.A., but the crazy part, got to L.A. and ended up doing everything but comedy. I mean, I was, you know, I tempt. I worked temp agencies. I worked for a modeling agency. I worked for, don't laugh at that. That ain't funny, okay? Anyway. No, you got style. Like, every night on Monique, you used to bring it. Yeah. 
No, I, I, I did data entry for a modeling agency, actually. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, I did that, and um, I looked up, and it was two years later, and I really wasn't doing what I came there to do. I understand. So, so how did you get focused back on the actual plan at hand? Well, I, I, I took a temp job at a, uh, at the VA and I was, um, I befriended this guy. He was an amputee, a double amputee. He had lost both of his legs at the knee and he and I would talk every day while I was on my temp assignment. And he just looked at me one day and asked me what I was doing there. And I was like, you know, I'm doing that entry. He said, no. He said, why are you here? And that was kind of my wake up call. And I, I left that job that day and I haven't done nothing but like some form of comedy since then. Okay. So now how did you do that and pay your bills? Cause you know, everybody wants to know cause everybody yeah. wants to do something in celebrity. Well, 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 this is the thing. I, I believe that God will take care of you if you trust him. You know what I mean? And he, he's, he's proven that to me time and time again, whether it was, you know, connecting with said the entertainer, you know, he gave me one of the, one of the more, lucrative jobs early on he allowed me to be the warm-up guy on one of his tv shows and at that time you know to live in la and be able to work in la was very valuable and so i was making fifteen hundred dollars a day working for said so i mean i would and i was working two days a week you talking about you know three thousand dollars a week a week yeah i'm killing them <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, that allowed me to stay in town and really kind of build my brand. And I did other stuff. I, I was on radio in L.A. for three years for free. I, um, you know, I did. Um, I don't know if you remember this. There was a segment on Tom Joyner's show called It's Your World. Yes, I do. Oh, that was the soap opera. I was on that soap opera. I played multiple characters on that soap opera for years. You know, and that would be like $75 a week. And you would go out there to the San Fernando Valley and and record these sessions. And, I mean, that $75, you know, got us to the next moment, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and then, of course, you start getting, you know, more popular and people, you know, fly you out to shows and stuff like that. So it just began to grow. Oh, that. Yeah, that, and this was, of course, before our wonderful social media, but we'll talk about that shortly. I mean, it was, so, I mean, it was the beginning. It was MySpace era. Right. Well, you, and so, well, did MySpace help you? Because I don't recall MySpace being that wonderful and helpful, like all the stuff we have now. It was, well, uh, the, the main beneficiary from MySpace was a comedian by the name of Dan Cook. And so he was there on the outset of MySpace. That's why... Periscope has been so value, valuable to me because what I recognize that we were on the cusp of it, of the beginning. Yes, if we were. Be, if you can be there at the outset, you're ahead of the power curve. And so I knew that from watching a guy like Dan Cook, you know, on, um, on MySpace. So I didn't personally benefit from MySpace. I had a pretty decent following. And then just one day, it wasn't cool no more. And I was like, damn. You're right. <laughs> it's just gone. Like, I mean, it's still there, but it just it's wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. It just wasn't the place to be anymore. Yeah. So now you have a wife, so she was okay with this whole, obviously, because you all picked up and moved. So what did she uh, think about this? She was not okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, man, I'm, I'm kind of a, how do I put this? I'm kind of a butthole when I get focused, you know, and, and I didn't give her an ultimatum, but we were going, <laughs> you know, and luckily for me, she was with me. And, uh, and I say this all the time. If, if I hadn't had my family, I probably would have fell into some of the pitfalls of some of my peers because you need somebody else to hold you accountable. You know, you need to be able to look at your children and be like, okay, um, I, I remember one incident early on. I would go to the club, and after the club, the comedy club, they would open up the bar. And so we would be drinking and having a good time, come home 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, right? And I came home one night, and my wife was like, where you been? I was like, you know, I'm at the club. We're taking care of business. <laughs> she was like, so you're taking care of business drunk? <laughs> 
And that was kind of my wake up call from her. It's like, okay, uh, how am I taking care of business if I'm not, I don't, I'm not in my right mind. And so, um, it, it's, it's incidences like that, that let you know that you got a great, you know, I mean, I, I have a team now with, with Madeline Smith and, and, uh, my, my man, you know, him and his family, uh, Richie Rich Media that does all our photography and stuff. And, and then we have a guy that does all our graphic we're, graphics. We're building the team, but my, my team is the Perry family. You know, and they they call me more accountable to anybody. That that that's wonderful, and you're right. That is very important, very important. So you're in LA, and you know, doing your thing. Mm -hmm. So what is the big break, and then how did you end up down in Atlanta? Oh man, oh man, it's so many breaks. Right. Um, uh, moving m moving to LA itself was a big break because uh, LA you just get information quicker. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like y you couldn't exist somewhere else in the world and be a great comedian. That's absolutely not true. But LA people, the comedians there, the actors there, you know, they get the information first. So just being in LA made me privy to a lot of, lot of you know, you know, the scuttlebutt is enough to get you booked somewhere. So uh, that, that was cool, just being there. Uh, my next milestone would have been um, I won the Bay Area Comedy Competition. Mm. Now, before the year before I won, I won in 2002. In 2001, they convinced me because I had swore off competitions. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't like it. It's not a bar. It's not, it's not my art. You know, I had a whole spiel. <laughs> and and I, I, I ended up doing it in 2001. And I made it to the semifinals. But I'll say this to your audience. Sometimes it's not your gift. Sometimes you just need to be cool. And so I was there. I was staying with a friend. And he let me use his car. And uh, one, of the, one of the guys I met was Cedric the Entertainer's role manager. Well, say his role manager, he was like, yo, can you give me a ride to my hotel? And I was like, you know, absolutely. So I, I was taking him to his hotel. And, you know, during the course of doing that, some, some girls asked us to take them to their hotel. So, you know, the best way for two guys to bond is over t women. <laughs> so we're giving these girls a ride. I'm, I'm, I'm talking them up like, yo, man, y'all better hook up with this guy. This guy is the guy, you know. And, uh, and you know, the girls left. They're like, whatever, bye. They left. <laughs> and, you know, on that ride back to his hotel, they say, Rod, you know what, man? You cool, dude. So I'm going to plug you up with said. And to be honest... Doc, I, I, in my mind, he was a lying sack of shit, okay? <laughs> I didn't believe him. I really didn't. And maybe a week later, after the competition, I made it to the semifinals, but I, I got out early. He called me, and he was like, Rodney, um, we're, we're doing the – because after Sid did the Kings of Comedy, he took a bunch of young comics out, and it was with Bud Light because he had Bud Light commercials at the time. So we had a, a huge tour bus. And Cedric the Entertainer really showed us what it was like to be a star. And he took us all around the country for all, all summer. And when I came back to the competition the following year, I was just ready. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had played Madison Square Garden. I had pay, played the Masonic Auditorium in the Bay Area. I played the Fox Theater in Detroit. I played, you know, Houston, Dallas. I've been all over the country that, that year. And first class accommodations and everything. And I just learned so much on that tour. So when I came back, I was supremely confident that following year. And uh, 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 the blessing out of that is, is I won that competition. And more than winning, it was getting the respect of my peers at that moment. So that was a huge milestone for me. But the connection with Cedric, which led to, you know, uh, my connection to Steve Harvey, which led to, uh, you know, put me on a stage where other people, other my other peers knew who I was. Okay. So, and so of course, like I said, we remember you from the Monique show and how did that transpire? So how did Monique happen? Before, before Monique and I did television, we did radio together. Oh, now, okay. So let me take you back in my story. So when I got to LA, I told you I did radio for like three years for free. Mm -hmm. So, 
I um I've been, you know, it, it started off just promoting a a night. I had a comedy night in LA at the Comedy Union, and they would spend the money for me to go in on Fridays. Well, Fridays became Fridays and Mondays, and then Fridays and Mondays became Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Before I knew it, was five days a week, and I was a part of the, the radio morning show. And it was it was kind of it was really great for me and building my brand, but it was literally no money. So, which is okay because I was still building my brand. I was like, okay, this is like, this is more valuable than if they paid me. That's the way I looked at it. And people talked about me. I mean, from my close friends to people that just knew me in past, like, I can't believe they ain't paying that brother. He need to get in. I wouldn't, I'll tell you, I wouldn't be going up there. Yes, you would. Stop lying. Okay. So, um, I, I was, I was, I was doing radio. So I just, that's a little tidbit. File out of way for a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. So meeting Monique, I was, um, I was, you know, again, becoming popular in LA. And so I got invited when she got a radio show. It was during the time we were about to elect Barack Obama for the first time. And they had a voting drive and they invited a bunch of comics to come out myself. Uh, Joe Torrey, Guy Torrey, a bunch of the comedians in and around LA. And when Monique and I got on the radio that day, it was like magic. It was like, yo, these two are crazy. And I had the, the perfect sensibility for her because I wasn't trying to outshine her, but at the same time, I was really funny. So I get a call the following day, yo, can you come in tomorrow? I was like, can't do tomorrow. I don't know what the hell I was doing, but I, I should have went. <laughs> so they said, okay, come in Wednesday. Okay. And I went in to the station that Wednesday. By Friday, they offered me the job as her co-host. And that was the beginning of a great relationship that I cherish to this day. Yes, I saw she uh, celebrated your birthday with you at your new radio show. Was that not dope? <laughs> that was off the chain. <laughs> so that was the beginning of our, our connection. And she had actually, well, even before that, she saw me in a club and she called me out of the blue. She was like, hey, this is Monique. I'm like, Monique who? She's like, Monique. I'm like, wow. So she <laughs> called me and she asked me, could she spent, could she take my wife on a shopping spree? And she took my wife out, spit. Mm -hmm. Like two thousand dollars at our home. We were living in a, a a three bedroom apartment in Inglewood, California, in the hood, and it was just amazing her generosity. And I remember asking her, like, "How do I pay you back?" And she said, "You don't pay me back. Someday you bless some comic the way I'm blessing you." And that was the real beginning of our relationship, which kind of opened the door for me to be able to go on the air with her later. And um, when the radio show got canceled, she looked at me. She said, "Rodney." Bigger and better things are coming. And two months later, um, they were they, we were doing the deal to go on uh, on the morning show. That was, and like I said, that was very, very good. And, you know, the funny thing is, so we met because of Royale Watkins, of course. Right. And I and I told Royale, I don't like comedy. Oh, wow. So what happened was at Michigan State, where I went to undergrad, we had so many comedy shows. I just was tired. I'm like, we saw, we had Michael Collier. I'm tired. Um, I think we had guys who are, we had so many comedy shows. Like every conference we went to was more comedy shows. I was wow. like, I'm done with, as a matter of fact, Cedric was on an elevator with me at a Nesby conference. And I was I, just I like, oh Nesby, my God. I did a Nesby conference uh, in, Phil in um, Pittsburgh. Okay. Years so ago. I was just like, so I was like, I'm comedied out. So then me and Royale got so tight. And so he would, you know, he'd come to Chicago. I was like, okay, I'm there. And I would go because um, he did, uh, he hosted for Chris Tucker. Yes. So we went to that show. And then I met the opener, London Brown. So when London came back with Chris wow. Tucker, I went to that show. And then I hooked up with Lonnie Love. I went to her show at the Improv. I had never even been to the Improv. Went to her show. And so I just started going to all these comedy shows. And so he said, you know, he's doing the stand-up for family. I said, well, if you're going to be in Chicago, I'm coming. Whatever it is, I'll come. And so then that's where we met. But I, I think I've never, until I met him, I didn't know how intricate and how exact comedy really was. Yeah. It's, it's definitely an art form. 
Um, I tell people all the time, I grew up with people that were funnier than me, but the thing that makes you get on stage is that's something else. You know what I mean? The thing that makes you go, you know what? I got to tell these people this little tidbit or right. I'm, I'm going to bust. That's what makes you a comedian. Yeah, last, um, two weeks ago, we had Junior from the Steve Harvey Morning Show. Oh, he's awesome. Awesome. He I, I remember one. when he started. He, he's one of the guys that, that, you know, he was opening for me and Cat Williams, and nobody knew who we were, and they damn sure didn't know who he was. <laughs> yes, he was. He is hilarious. And I, I met Tony Roberts. When I met Junior, I met Tony Roberts, and um, Cupid interest, introduced all of us because they were all on Nephew Tommy's tour, and they were here in Chicago. Got it, got it. So that's how I met them. But, um, but yeah, and I, I just didn't know how intricate comedy was until – Royale, and then listening to Steve talk about it sometime on his show, mm -hmm. I'm like, it really is something involved in this. It's not just get up there and talk. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of get up there and talk. I mean, that's definitely a, a part of it, but I mean, I evaluate everything. I evaluate, I used to, i tell you what, one thing. I used to, um, when I, on the lean years, when I was, you know, in LA hustling, I had a lawyer, that would come see me at comedy clubs. And he said, Rodney, he said, you have a gift that you probably don't realize you have. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, you're able to make judgments about people just by looking at them. And I was like, well, that's not always good. He said, it's, he said but you do it accurately because you're evaluating them to make them laugh. And he was absolutely right. So what I used to do for him, he would give me a couple hundred bucks and I would read his cases and I would tell him what I thought. And the only reason I stopped doing it because it started depressing me because he, he was a defense attorney. So it was like this dude going to jail forever. <laughs> you know? But it would help him with his juror or voyeur to yep. get my opinion. So uh, th that goes to show that it, it's a lot more involved than people really know uh, when you start talking about stand up, what it's about. So, because you are a family man, how did all of this, because once the Monique show was over and you, you know, you've been on the road a lot, especially recently, how does that all play into your family life? I mean, like right now, I've been here almost a month. They about ready to kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> My family's like, what, ain't you got to go? Will you, you know, it's, it's kind of, I remember, Doc, I remember just wanting to get on a plane to go somewhere. And so, I mean, just the fact that I travel as much as I do is a dream come true. Right. You know, I tell people all the time, I'm a comedian. I'm already a winner. I mean, would I like to achieve the Kevin Hart success or, you know, you know, be a, a nationwide, you know, household name like some of my peers? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, if, if, if I never take one more step forward, I'm good because I can make a living telling jokes. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the gift in itself. So did you ever imagine that this would be your life? Absolutely. I knew it. Okay. I knew it. I knew it. I had a teacher in second grade that would let me tell jokes at the end of the day if I would shut up throughout the course of the day. So you know, Junior said that his class, if they were good, one of his teachers would let him tell jokes on Fridays. Mm -hmm. I would. I would. This was a daily practice. Mr. Thompson would let me tell jokes at the end of the day. And it was like... Um, you know, you have certain people that can see you. You know, some people can't see you. You know, I had a manager one time and this guy was managing me for over a year. And one day I'm on stage and I walked off and he met me at the side of the stage and was like, yo, <laughs> you're brilliant. And I was like, tell me you didn't just see me. <laughs> you know, how have you been working for me? And you, you just saw me today. Right, right. Yeah, I gave him his walking paper. We <laughs> but yeah, it's it's uh it's one of those things, man. You just you just go for it, and you know uh, I I believe I call it a leap of faith. You got to be willing to take that leap, regardless of your profession. At some point, God's gonna require that you take that leap, and everybody that that's successful took the leap and trusted God. You know, and that's that's what it's all about. This and this is a. Uh... A never-ending theme. This is the 41st episode, and this is a theme that keeps everyone keeps saying the same thing. You have to just jump. At some point, you're going to have to jump out there and just pray for the best. 
But but this is the other side of it. Sometimes God will push you. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So I, I met I met a gentleman just this weekend, and he he just started his own business. He owns a barbecue place here in Atlanta, and he's like, man, he said they gave me a deal I couldn't refuse. I, my job, they had just downsized my position. I said, so you got pushed off the cliff. He's like, yes, I did. <laughs> you know, so yeah. So how do you feel when the public recognizes you? You know, that's what I signed up for. You know, I can remember wanting to sign an autograph. I used to doodle my name hundreds and hundreds of times on the sheet of paper. So to, to sign an autograph or to take a picture, you know, that's what I signed up for. I, I mean, I, I get, you know, like some of the reality stars that I've met, I don't think they signed up for this. You know, so they're, they're not really ready to deal with the public sometimes. And and by and then everybody that's a comedian or an actor isn't personable, you know. So I mean, I'm one of those people that that that's part of my gift is to be personal. And I and I've I've seen people like said the entertainer who who never met a stranger, people like Monique that'll hug you for ninety seconds, you know, <laughs> a stranger, you know. And so I I, re, I respect that, and, and that's the that's the tutelage that I came under is is treat everybody like gold, man. And that's that's the other thing that I say too. Um, what was the first moment you realized you were doing exactly what you were put on this earth to do? Oh man, when I knew exactly, it came out of a really a tough situation. Before I made the the, the complete decision to move out of the Bay Area to to LA, I I got on the show at a Fat Tuesday, which was. Um, at that time was the, the 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 dopest comedy room for urban comedy in the country. Guy Tory was the host. It was crazy. I mean, I mean, you could easily do a set and it changed your life in this room. So I had some friends that that knew I was funny and they talked me up on that show. And I went in there about 45 seconds into my set, started getting booed. And they were when I this is the thing, Doc. Comics and singers and actors are the only people that get booed. A boo is when everybody decides they hate you all at once, okay? And it's one guy, I can still see him if I look over there. He stood up and started booing me. And I was like, yo. So I tried to, you know, I tried to I tried to bag on him, rank on him. And then the boo start popping up like wildfire. So I'm like, God dang it. So guy comes out, he's like, yo, dude, I can't let you talk about my crowd like that. Uh, this just ain't your night. And then he talked about me. He's, I hope that dude didn't fly out here because he ain't going to be able to get back on the plane with them bombs. He killing me, right? Now, I'm behind the curtain, and I'm like, yo, this is not why I came here. Now, I had driven to the show. My, my aunt, who lived in L.A., I was sleeping on her floor that night. Her boyfriend owned a limo company. We drove to the show in a limo. So I'm in a limo with six people I don't know. So I, I, I just got booed. I'm thinking about facing them. And, and then they said, somebody in the audience said, well, he didn't even get a chance. Somebody else said, let him come back. So he opened the curtain, and I was there. And he brought me back on stage. He's like, man, you know, I mean, you had a tough set. You want to try it again? I was like, yeah. He's like, all right, I'm going to give you an intro. Now, the first intro, he brought me up like the dude from the Five Heartbeats. You know, when, when they give him the bad intro, this, this next guy said he better than Eddie Murphy. And Chris Tucker all rolled into one. We shall see. He gave me that intro. So the second time he brought me up, ladies and gentlemen, coming to the stage, one of the coldest comics. You've seen her from Chicago. Show some love. Right here. He brought me up. Now, now I'm going through my mind. I'm like, okay, okay. Do the joke that you was going to close on. Just do that joke, and that should be at least get you a laugh. I did that joke. I got a laugh, and it wasn't no great laugh. I mean, it was – probably on a scale of one to 10, maybe a strong six, seven tops. And I took a deep breath and I said, you know what? I think that's all I'm gonna get out of y'all tonight. My name is Rodney Perry. That's my time. And that was the moment because I knew if I could go through the gamut of emotion that I experienced that moment to lose and then to come back and have some semblance of a win, I knew, I knew that nothing else could stop me. 
that the, the I, see, I couldn't take the booze. <laughs> like, the wait booze. a minute, what? You know, I got a whole theory. I think regular people should be booed. Like the lady at McDonald's that, that you asked for ketchup, she said she's going to give you ketchup, but don't give you no ketchup. Boo! <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> so uh, we have some questions from the audience. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, do you have a certain ritual before your performance, a prayer or meditation or anything? I do not. Uh, I see comics backstage shadow boxing and doing all kinds. I'll be like, what the hell are you doing, dude? Just, <laughs> I, you know, I believe in preparation. You know, I do prepare, but my preparation starts at here in my office, you know, and, um, you, you just knock it out. And, you know, by the time I'm about to walk on the stage, it's just, you know, I, like I can have, you know, people would be tripping off me. Like my friends are like, man, you want me to get these people out your, out your green room? I'm like, mm, they're okay. <laughs> you know, I don't need. I, I the worst thing for me is to be by myself. Gotcha. Uh, so I, I like you know I I like to I like people I like to kick it you know talk crack some jokes and and uh, and then I go out there and work man I, I love it you know it's it's fun I'm telling jokes for God's sake. Uh, what is the next big thing for comedians? Everyone wants their own sitcom, and comedy's changed so much since the days of the late Red Fox and Richard Pryor. So what's new for the future of comedy? Um, I think we have more control than ever now. Um, it used to be a time you had to be in LA. Now because of social media and the internet, you can kind of be anywhere. Um, what's, what's new? I mean, there's really nothing new. You still need to get on television. You still need movies. Um, you need to put yourself in the collective consciousness like it's it's very difficult. Like for the people that were part of the Def Jam era or the Comic View era, the early ones, you got to think that that was the only platform. So now, fast forward 15, 20 years later, people consume comedy at a high rate, whether it's on social media, whether it's on television, um, uh, BT, uh, Def, Def Jam. Um, videotapes, Netflix, Hulu, people consume a lot of comedy, Comedy Central. So it's really more difficult now. And just like you see the resurgence of African Americans on television with Scandal and Empire and Blackish, that's part of the comedy landscape as well. Because black people in general disappeared from television for over a decade. Mm -hmm. you know? Outside, outside of reality TV, we were gone. And so now we're getting back to television. So what happened is there's a group of my peers that didn't graduate. Because what used to happen is you would do comedy, then you would get discovered for TV and film, then you would, you would graduate and you start doing theaters and things of that nature. And now the people that used to graduate, now they're still doing the clubs. So my group had to wait. Because these guys are more famous than than some of us. I mean, I, I'm I'm a, I'm an anomaly because I have I, I have that celebrity because of some of the TV stuff I've done. But you know, my 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 equal peers, it's very difficult for for them right now. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting landscape. But at least um, you know we got the um, Carmichael show got picked up. Yes, uh, Gerard Carmichael. I think he's a really amazing young kid. Now, I had never heard of him. I watched it, of course, because you know I live in Chicago. So I watched it because of Little Rel. Yeah. And yeah, so that's why I watched the show originally. Then I noticed Loretta Devine was on. And of course, I am a Detroiter, so David Allen Greer is represented. Oh, I love, I love him on there. He's amazing. Yeah. So that's a great show. And I'm sad that Mr. Robinson's now didn't make it. Yeah, it wasn't that good, though. And I love Craig. <laughs> okay. I mean, I love Craig. That just wasn't a good vehicle for him. So what um, what upcoming comedian would you want to play in your biopic? Would I want to play? Mm -hmm. or would would you I want to play you? Oh, shoot, man. Um, I don't know, man. I, I think he's a kid right now. <laughs> You're you know, right. You're I'm still is. writing this story. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, you know it's, it's, I, I would be interested to see what isms of mine that, that a person would you know, and I gotta do something. Like I gotta. I don't have no cocaine. I don't have nothing. You don't know. Say that. 
I need to, I need to, I need to spice up my story. I'm about to go upstairs and beat my wife once I get off of this. <laughs> my, my story ain't, ain't, ain't interesting enough you know, right now. So I have to tell you, and I'm so mad I did not send the link to my dad. When you told that story about when you and your wife went walking on the mountain and you had to go to the bathroom. Oh, no, no, that, that really happened. I know it didn't. <laughs> It was so funny. That is so. I was texting. I text my sister. I text one of my girlfriends. She had to show her husband. I was like, you got to watch this man tell this story. Funniest thing ever. I had the boo-boo. And when it, when it, this is the thing. And I, I'm, a, I'm a really kind of manic person. So I have a ritual. Like No, I and I got you because I'm the same way. I have. I can't just jump up and do stuff. I, I, to, I knew what you were talking about. I was right there with you. I have to slowly get up. So this particular I thing, do. I just jumped up. <laughs> and so we call ourselves going to exercise. Boy, I got about, I got, I got too far from anything. <laughs> and boy, I had to go and bed it over in the woods. <laughs> it was nasty. <laughs> Oh, that was the funniest thing ever. I was like, oh my God. I said, this is the funniest thing ever. And it was, I think you told that story late at night too. I was like, I can't even go to sleep. I was laughing so hard. Yeah. You know, the, the, that's the thing about comedy. It, it's the closer you get to telling the real stuff, the better you are as a comedian. Well, no, you have the most strangest experiences because you were like, see, if I had said this, you'd never believe it happened. Remember when the dude was sitting at the Waffle House naked as a jaybird? Oh my God! People do he not. Died. He was he think. was periscoping. I saw the dude. He was sitting there naked. The boy was so out of it. He didn't know which way was up, which way was down. There was another naked dude last week at the barbershop. I'm like, is it is it me? Am I cute? I don't know. <laughs> and then what about when you were in the hotel and dude fell out of the elevator? Remember, you had to get off periscope to help him. I help. I did help that guy. <laughs> I, but look, I wish Periscope was around about eight years ago. We got stuck in Salt Lake City, Utah. I end up helping a handicapped dude on and off of the toilet and bathroom. Like, you know, I think <laughs> stuff happens to me all the time. <laughs> I'm really like I'm a walking sitcom. No bull. <laughs> you need that. You need that reality show. The cameras need to follow you. I don't. I, I my wife. Like, my wife vetoes all reality. She says she don't want to be a part of it. Well, you know how they work them nowadays. She may be the next. <laughs> I know. They, they'll give you a wife, actually. Right. right. So please tell everyone. I love your step and repeat. You see, I have mine, too. Tell yeah. everyone about never um, Next Level Never Deny, because I think that is so awesome. It is. It is. You know what? I never intended for it to be awesome, but it's really awesome. And what I mean by that, you know, when, when I listen to the stories of the people that have been through my class, and they tell me how they have confidence and they're and they're taking their careers to the next level, you know, because it's it's a basically what it is, it's the improv workshop. And um it's really not about improv though, it's about trusting your choices, whether you're an actor or a comedian or or whether you're a 911 operator or a DJ, you can take this class and walk away with uh an increased ability to trust yourself. And that's really what it's about, it's six weeks. At the end of the six weeks, six weeks, we put up a live show in front of a live audience. And man, when I tell you, it is so rewarding to watch these people. I mean, I charge 200 bucks per person, but some people come to me and they don't have the money and, and they have a great vibe, a great energy. And I'll be like, just come on. We, we I want you to be in this group. And it, it's never failed, man. It, it's just a great situation. Yeah, and he just started the latest, um the latest group last week. Well, I start. Right? I start next week. I, I pushed okay. it back because I wanted okay. to give some people that was out of town a chance to start. So I won't start this Tuesday because I'll be on the road. But I will start next Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, I, I I saw that and was like, that is really cool, and that's very similar. Just like Tasha Smith does her acting workshop. I said, well, Say. you know, you know, I'm a product of Tasha Smith acting workshop. I didn't know that. Yes, I I was I was in T-Saw. Yeah, Tasha Smith. And what people don't know, Tasha Smith was a stand-up. No. Yes. But Tasha I believe Smith. it. I've met Tasha Smith, and she is hilarious. She's funny. She's She was a stand-up. And so that's one of the reasons I liked her as an acting coach, because she understood me as a stand-up. 
and she knew what I would go through as a stand-up. So she would pull me to the side and give me notes, not just as an actor, but Rodney, you'll also be getting opportunity to do this, this, and this, and you got to be ready for this. So, you know, I, I, I always thank her, man. I, I went through her class like maybe three years. Okay. Yeah. Is that where Tyler Perry saw you? No, no. I, okay. Tyler Perry was, you know, I mean, it was a combination of things. Well, during that time, Tyler Perry had a little lightweight beef with Monique. So they wouldn't hire me at first. Oh, Lord. Yeah, that's what I said. I'm like, dude, are you doing your damn mind? <laughs> so, so, so that we end up squashing that, and I I got opportunity to do episode of Meet the Browns, and I went in and read for that role with a, a cast agent by the name of Alpha Tyler, who is hands down the most awesome person I've ever auditioned for. She was just so kind, and the way she conducted the audition was just dope. Well, I, I, I read for Meet the Browns and booked that. Great experience there. And that's why I met Tyler Perry for the first time. But, you know, we really didn't connect the dots. But um, a, another fellow Chicagoan, um, what's his name? Um, Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry. Um, he's a big time casting agent. Anyway. Oh, well, uh, Ruben Cannon. Ruben Cannon. Well, Ruben Cannon had cast me in Johnson Family Vacation with Cedric. So when I go in to read for Tyler for the movie, there the he second is. step before you meet Tyler is Ruben Cannon. And so he's like, man, why do I know you? I was like, well, I, I, you know, this will, you know, I said, when you book me, this will be the second time you book me. He's like, oh, you, you, you think you got I me. like that. I like that. And I told him the story. He's like, oh, my God, that was you. Okay, good stuff. Well, I said, you're here. And, and you knew I was in Atlanta. And um, the, the thing about me, man, I, 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 I'm pretty good at auditioning now, but I wasn't good at it, you know, because it's another animal. Booking a role and auditioning is two different things. So um, I auditioned and I just knew the guy, you know, the, the, the Medea's big happy fan. I knew Harold. You know, I've been married so many years. I know what it's like to be in a relationship and not be having sex. You know, I know what it's like to have kids, you know, kind of monopolize your relationship. I, so I kind of knew him on a lot of levels. You know, my wife is a strong black woman, so I know how women don't shut up sometimes. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so when I read this guy, my only question was, does he have a moment of redemption? Because he really got beat up in the movie. He did. And when I read that part, I was like, I'm in. I want to play this guy. And, and I, I knew him. And so... You know, I've been lucky enough in my career to play guys that I actually know. And so what TV shows are you on this fall? This fall, um, I'm on a bounce show called A Family Time. I did four episodes of Family Time. Um, I got some some independent films that I shot. I go into production with a film next week. Next week? Next week. And um, and I'm writing, man. I'm writing now for the first time in my career. I want to I want to create something, you know, for all these students that I've had go through my class, almost 100 people. I want to create something that they, that they can shine in. That That's cool. That's cool. And actually, I was just watching Wendy Raquel Robinson's Being last night, and she <clears throat> has had several of her students. Elle Varner was one of her students. My children went to her went to her class. class. Oh, okay. So, yeah. okay. so, yeah, it's it's amazing, man. She, she's an awesome lady. Yeah. Well, I, you you are just amazing to me. I just I'm like Rodney is so crazy and so funny, but you have you really do social media and you do it very well because not a lot of celebrities do it well. You do it well. You know so. the, the secret, as I see it, is be transparent. You know mm -hmm. whether you're on Periscope or Instagram or Twitter. You know I try to be transparent and I take pride in. in you know I might not have the most people, but the twenty five thousand. Uh, Instagram followers and the 60,000 Twitter followers are real. Right. Like, They're going to ride for you. you They're not spam bots. Million, my million hearts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm almost at 800,000. We're going to get there soon. But, oh, you uh, will. You will. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, I so appreciate you coming on the show today. Wow. Because we've been trying to do this since we got on Periscope. I know. I'm a huge fan. 
Doc, I mean, thank you. You have the you have you have the bestest smile, <laughs> and um, you know you, the, your forehead is amazing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you so and, and your sister is dope. And yeah, I just I just love all the stuff that you you stand for, man. You're just a a good person, man. Are you are you dating? Let me interview you. <laughs> no, I'm not, Rodney. You can hook me up with somebody. Hey, I tell my friend, any female friend, you don't want to meet my friends. All my oh. friends are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. That That's rough. But um, there was one thing I just... Boy. Why you introduce me to Larry? And I'm like, right. <laughs> exactly. That's just what I do, too. Yeah. Um, there was one thing I just told somebody the other day. I said, Rodney decided he wanted to get real fancy with Periscope and get another platform going. Now people do it all the time, but you were one of the first, I'm sure. So he's like, I want to Skype with somebody. And I was literally closing down to go to sleep. I know, right? And he's like, Doc, I know you got Skype. I go, shoot. <laughs> I said, yes, I have Skype. Well, come on, come on. I'm like, oh, my God, Rodney. I'm going platforms. to Isn't that a great idea? And look it's at like you now. 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, Lord, here we go. And yeah. I go, you can't put me on Periscope too. I am like totally like ready for bed. Oh, it's no big deal. Come on. <laughs> I love it. Like, oh, I said, so let me ask you something, Doc. With this, yeah. are people watching us live or will they? Yes, see they are. Too? You can say, you can say, uh, somebody's birthday was today, and I don't forget who it was because I said maybe they said happy birthday, and I forget. Oh, I know it wasn't today. But my mom and dad are definitely watching, and my sister, of course. Hey, mom and dad. Hey, sis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, que the some of the questions came from Bam. Bam is one of the program directors in radio here in Chicago. Oh, wow. She's, okay. uh, she's over, I'm sure you know, Soul 106.3 and 92.3. Yeah. yeah, she's over there in Hammond. Got it. Oh, and I think Royale is watching because he just texted me. Yes, Royale yes. Watson, <laughs> one of my favorite humans right there. Yes, mine too. Mine too. Well, thank you so much. I um, what you call? We don't hang up right away, but let me just real quickly. Um, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Next week, same time, same place. Next week, we have Candace Nicole PR, Candace Mackle, the owner of Candace Nicole PR. She currently has a nice roster of clients. Um, she's a publicist, but one of her favorite, one of my favorite people that she's a publicist for is Music Soul Child. So we will talk to her about her journey of how she quit BET, coincidental, and is now doing this full time. And she is a young lady. So she, I think she just turned 30 or is about to be 30. So she's young, but she's doing her thing. So I'm excited to see her. And then the big announcement, everybody, is on October 25th, when Jesus says yes, no one can say no because Michelle Williams will be on the Ask Dr. Renee show. October 25th, 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock uh, Central and six o'clock Pacific. So I look forward to seeing everyone. My Periscope show is daily on Periscope Renee's Remedies, 10 o'clock Central Standard Time, 11 o'clock Eastern, eight o'clock Pacific. And you can watch all the episodes of the Ask Dr. Renee show on my um, website as well as my YouTube channel. I am Ask Dr. Renee on all social media principles, all, all social media platforms. Rodney is Rodney Perry on Twitter, Rodney Perry live on Instagram, and Rodney Perry, you're Rodney Perry, Twitter and Periscope, and you're you have a YouTube Twitter, channel. Twitter, Periscope right? website, and Rodney yeah. Perry live on Instagram. Yeah, RodneyPerry.com. Go visit it. Very well done website too. Very, very, very nice. Way Excellent to go, Madeline job. Smith. Oh, and Madeline's a Detroiter, so Madeline is all right with me too. I grew so. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, everyone. I'll see you next week. Wait a sec, Rodney.